Ladies and gentlemen, the news at 11. Channel 1 had a special about yellow alert, so I worried a lot, don't want to get hurt. Channel 2 said the flu was going around, so I got a flu shot and went out of town. Channel 3 said those flu shots are dangerous too, so I turned on Channel 4 to find out what to do. They said see a doctor so I could survive. In the waiting room, I waited and watched Channel 5. Channel 5 and a tranquilizer made me feel fine. Those soap opera problems are much worse than mine. But at home, Channel 6 had a story about pills and how people drop dead from prescription or thrills. So I called back the doctor as I watched Channel 7. A star was in rehab, news at 11. So I went into rehab where I watched Channel 8, all about crime and murder and hate. And when I got home, I tuned in Channel 9 and watched Blood and Horror on some battle line. I took a deep breath and screamed, and then gave up and fainted as I watched Channel 10. When the paramedics woke me, the answer was clear. So I killed my TV and stopped living in fear. That's another one of the wonderful new poems from Laurie Boxer's new book, Swamp Gas. Um, these are available for sale at the Congress Book and Tape. Wonderful stuff. Laurie, are you in the room? Laurie, if you're in the room, stand up. There she is. Okay. Let's give her a hand. This is the young lady that, that ha writes these marvelous poems. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, he doesn't need an introduction. I mean, he really doesn't. New York Times best-selling author. author. He, he had uh, his book, Crossfire, made into the film, he, as you all know, on the Kennedy assassination. Um, he's written the number one selling book ever on the alien phenomena, alien agenda. He's been deeply involved, of course, as a writer and reporter and in the journalistic field for decades. He is intimately familiar with the control of information. And how, you know, how he can come up and do the kind of research that he does absolutely mystifies me. I mean, he, he's one in a million the world is blessed to have such a person that'll put it on the line and then share it with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Mars. Um, hopefully I'm on this mic so that way I can move around. Okay. It is a distinct pleasure to be with you. There we go. This is better. <laughs> it's a distinct pleasure to be here with you folks today. Uh, I guess from Texas we'd say y'all. If I was from a little further north, I'd say you guys. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, it really is because I kind of consider you all home folks. Uh, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of here preaching to the choir. Uh, you people are the ones who come out of your homes, turn off that TV, that daily drumbeat of fear and, and uh, depression, and actually come out to try to find out what's really going on. So today I'm going to try to share some of this. We've got a lot of ground to cover, and I may just get to rattling. So uh, if you miss something, uh, buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a few, a few unabashed uh, plugs here. Before I launch into the program, which is going to be about rule by secrecy, with, uh, and for those of you who have read the book, uh, I've got a PowerPoint program here that I hope will uh, make it even be more graphic for you, maybe even uh, more understandable. Plus, I have a very, very important piece of information that is not in rule by secrecy because I did not find this out until after publication. But before we do that, I want to tell you about something that I've recently come up with that, to my way of thinking, 
is a true smoking gun uh, in the field of UFOs. Um, I recently, recently completed a, a uh, little documentary, Aurora, the UFO Crash of 1897. Before Roswell, before the Foo Fighters, there was Aurora. And this one actually was documented in the newspapers of the time. Now, <clears throat> you will find an account of Aurora in my book, Alien Agenda. But at that time, I had gone into the old uh, Fort Worth Star-Telegram into their microfilm and had uh, many years ago, back about 1973, and had found the story. And like an idiot, I didn't copy the whole thing. I just jotted some notes. I can still remember the memorable line. It said, the pilot, comma, who was not of this world, comma, <laughs> you know, just like, just like you might as well have said, you know, who had red hair. Um, very, very blasé about it. And then later, uh, the, the story I quote in Alien Agenda is the story that I got from the Dallas Morning News, which of course is still in publication. But all I'd had up until about two weeks ago was a copy of the story. And I won't bother you with the story because it's in Alien Agenda and it's been reprinted other places. Now the debunkers cannot say it wasn't in the newspapers at the time because it was. So their argument is that it was just a hoax story and that it was planted there by Judge Proctor who was a little bit saddened because the railroad had bypassed Aurora, which uh, up until about 1897 had been a fairly thriving town in North Texas. And it was kind of dying on the vine and he was trying to drum up some excitement <coughs> for Aurora. Okay, that's <clears throat> plausible enough, and I certainly paid attention to that. Until about two weeks ago, when I managed to secure a copy of the entire front page of the Dallas Morning News from April the 19th, 1897. Main headlines talking about the great aerial wanderer. There are 16 stories on this front page and every single one of them concerns the large silver cigar-shaped object flying over Texas. Now this, folks, is in the spring of 1897. This is seven years before the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk. This is seven years before the first powered uh, balloon flight in the United States, the California era, and also in 1904. These reports range from the Oklahoma border as far south as Austin, Texas. <clears throat> and it's really incredible. Wortham, Fire Freestone County. Captain John A. Lilly, a prominent and respected citizen of this place, a Mexican War veteran, claims that he saw the mysterious airship last night at 9.30. He said it was going straight up. Kind of leaves out a meteor, doesn't it? And of course, we have the story here about the crash in Aurora. And it says the pilot of the ship is supposed to have been the only one on board. And while his remains are badly disfigured, enough of the original has been picked up to show that he was not an inhabitant of this world. I'm telling you folks, this was recorded years ago. And I have, I have some copies of this front page. It's really worth getting. On two occasions, there's an account of where it actually landed and people communicated with the crew. One time they were told that this was a secret invention that had been developed by an inventor in mid-state New York and that he and two assistants had taken off uh, to test it and it was such a success that they soon found themselves over Indiana. So they just kept going <laughs> and ended up in Texas. And they said, well, now, don't say anything to anybody. Don't, don't spread the word about this, because uh, when we get everything patented, we're going to release this, and it's going to revolutionize transportation. But in the same story, from a different place, we have a fellow who says it landed, and they told him that they were from the North Pole in a, in a strange and ice-free area up there where uh, their ancestors had settled and that they were developing this technology. Now. An even stranger story, this one to me is a tip-off that something's going on. 
and this is not in this Dallas paper, but in the old Fort Worth Register, there was a story of a railroad track inspector who was, a, it was getting late in the evening, he was about to turn back and head back to the city when he saw a bright light up ahead and he went up to investigate and he said there was a large silver cigar shaped object sitting on the railroad track and that there was some crewmen around in blue uniforms. And um, said so the captain came up and talked to him and told him that they had had to stop, make some repairs to their craft and that uh, not to say anything about this because they were on a secret mission. He said they, uh, the, the craft was full of dynamite and they were going to go bomb Havana. <laughs> now for those of you who were not asleep in history class, you might recall that the Spanish-American War did not begin for another year. And that was only after the mysterious explosion of the battleship Maine in Havana Harbor. So what's going on here? Why, why would somebody a year previously, how did they know we were going to have a war with Cuba, with Spain that included Cuba? This may have to do with what John Spencer, uh, who wrote the UFO Encyclopedia, calls cultural tracking. And this is that the inhabitants of these craft have the ability to mask themselves, cloak themselves, if you will, and give the appearance of the technology at the time. The fellow who was told that this was a device that had been developed in New York State was told that it, uh, it ran by electricity. Well, of course, today that sounds pretty antiquated. But keep in mind, 1897, rural North Texas, they didn't have electricity. Only big cities had electricity, and it was still kind of a new marvel. And uh, there's some support for this argument because early on, back in the 50s, when the contactees were first talking about being taken aboard these craft and stuff, they talked about these rotary dials with numbers on them, okay? Because that was our technology. Today, we have people, the experiencers and abductees, who say that they've seen these uh, um, LED things like the, like the watches and clocks we have today because now we have that technology. So it's really kind of an interesting aspect of this whole thing. But I wanted to share with you all the story of Aurora because it is becoming more and more documented in the tape about Aurora and, and uh, I apologize this is not a Hollywood production. This was uh, made on less than a shoestring but the information is there, including interviews with people, descendants of uh, people in Wise County who, who were there and observed what was going on. And of course, these are available, and like I said, you can get a copy of this front page. If you have friends and relatives that are skeptics and said, why well, there's nothing there, show them the front page of the Dallas Morning News, 1897. Um, one other quick thing, I just have to put in a little plug here. I don't have to remind you of the war rattles and the saber rattling that's going on today in regards to uh, Iraq and also North Korea. I'd just like to quote you from President John F. Kennedy. And uh, this was back at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis when people were actually pointing real missiles at the United States. Now if there was ever an excuse for us to threaten war with somebody, that would have been it. Today, what have they found? A few empty artillery shells and, and some, you know. President Kennedy said, the United States, as the world knows, will never start a war. We do not want a war. We want to build a world of peace where the weak are safe and the strong are just. We labor on, not toward a strategy of annihilation, but toward a strategy of peace. Think about that, folks. How far have we come from a leader who epitomizes peace and the, and the seeking of peace through strength to a leader who says, if you don't like what we want to do, we'll just come kill you. It's amazing. Now, how many of y'all have heard uh, of, of uh, the mystery of Rens Le Chateau? How many of you really truly understand what that's all about? <laughs> Stick with me, I think I'll help put this together for you. How many of y'all are familiar with the uh, work of Zachariah Zitchin? Okay. Stick with me. I think I can tie this together for you. 
But first, we're going to have a pop test. Everybody got pencil, paper, number one to ten? No, you don't have to do that. How long did the Hundred Years' War last? <laughs> Anybody? I saw 116 years, you get the gold star. 116 years for the Hundred Years' War. What color is a purple finch? It's red. Okay? Which country makes Panama hats? Ecuador. Where does the term America come from? Ah, oh, some of you all went to the same high school I did. Amerigo Vespucci. The Portuguese navigator, right, uh, whose name became associated with this new world of America. Wrong. Bzz. No. That story came from a monk, German monk, who lived on the Franco-German border back in the 1500s, named Martin Walsemüller. And good old Martin, I don't think he probably ever got more than about 25 miles from his home in his life. But in about 1515, he got access to a printing press. And he wrote a book. And he knew that there was a new world that they called America. And he knew about Amerigo Vespucci. So he said, oh, well, it was named after Amerigo Vespucci. He later retracted that but we don't get his retracting because it was in the book and the book keeps going on and takes a life of its own and this is what we all get taught. Now the point of this is, most of what we think we know, we don't know. And it's wrong. And I just want you to keep that in mind. Because let me tell you something, your mind is like a parachute. Works better when it's open. <clears throat> All right, now to try to hurry on through this. <clears throat> I do fine until I get up in front of people. I guess you all make me nervous. You notice how nervous I am. Rule by secrecy, the hidden history that connects the Trilateral Commission the Freemasons and the Great Pyramid. Now, I hate going to places where they put up something and then they read it to you. Hey, thank you, I can read just fine. But I do want to read you this first quote and then I'm not gonna read you the rest. You can read them for yourself. But this one, I think, tells the story. And this is not a conspiracy theorist. This is not Jim Mars's quote. This is Woodrow Wilson a very powerful insider, an insider who was put into office by men connected to secret societies. He knew what was going on, and what did he write? Some of the biggest men in the United States are afraid of somebody. They're afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive that they better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. How much more do you want, folks? He's trying to tell us what's going on. Now what I've done here and what I'm going to present to you all is a synthesization easy for me to say, Synthetiz synthesization, a, a compilation <laughs> maybe they're landing, I don't know, of more than 300 books. And what I'm going to be trying to show you today is bringing together two heretofore believed unconnected topics of research. And this is going to get interesting in the coming years because most of you have been at this UFO research game for a long time. And when you started off, it was most people just really laughed and snickered at you. Today, 
Some of them still do, but some of them don't. Today there's a rising and growing acceptance that there's something out there and that we're probably not being told the truth. Oh, boy. Okay, so where we see that the UFO is now gaining acceptance in the, uh, in, in the minds of the public, uh, this uh, Steven Spielberg Taken series, you know, what a deal. I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of Hollywoodization there, and of course they had to make up some stuff because they had a story, they had to end their story, and the real story hasn't ended, okay? But yet, for those of you who have done your homework, you'll realize that about the first eight episodes of that show was, is fully backed by evidence, by testimony, and by documentation. So the idea of the um, UFO is growing in, in acceptance. Lagging behind is a parallel issue about the control of secret societies and how they tie together and how that they are pushing harder than ever at this very moment for what they call globalization or what you may have heard referred to as the new world order, okay? It's nothing new about it. It's the oldest game on the planet and they're still pushing it. So I can see that at some point in the near future, these two issues are, are going to uh, blend together. They're gonna meet and we're gonna have a whole new paradigm to deal with, so I'm gonna give you folks a little leg up. What I, uh, my initial thesis going into Rule by Secrecy was that the secret societies are not isolated groups, that, they're, that they do connect, and in fact connect all the way back through history. And I was right, and you can read all about that. So let's quickly, I'm gonna quickly run you through the modern secret societies and how they connect. And I'm gonna to try to do this as rapidly as possible to get to the really good stuff. And some of you all are gonna start saying, well, what's this got to do with UFOs? Bear with me and I think you'll find out. We'll start with the Trilateral Commission, which is one of the more recent ones. This was formed in uh, 1973. Uh, by David Rockefeller and one of his henchmen, Zygmunt Brzezinski. Um, and it was obviously an outgrowth, an extension of the even older and more secretive Council on Foreign Relations because David Rockefeller and Brzezinski were both members. All seven original members of the Council on Foreign Relations were members of the, uh, I mean, uh, seven members of the Trilateral Commission were members of the Council on Foreign Relations. So it's safe to say that it was simply a little more open, a little more public, uh, extension of the Council on Foreign Relations. What it also did was, because of its name, Trilateral, which refers to the trilateral nations of uh, Japan at that time to include China now, North America and Europe, the trilateral nations. And uh, so not only was it an effort to uh, have a little bit more open, uh, less secretive organization, but to also to include the Asian economies. Uh, they put out various position papers, and I particularly like the one issued in 1975, Democracy in Crisis, where they basically said and argued that, you know, there's a little bit too much democracy in the United States, and it's just really not good for business, so uh, maybe we need to curtail that a little bit. Now, that was 1975, and I asked some of you older folks here about my age, do we have more or less democracy in the United States today? Seems like that uh, they're getting what they want. You, you might also notice, the, I found it interesting, the, uh, the logo of the Trilateral Commission looks suspiciously like a stylized swastika. And that may not be my imagination, as you will soon see. Senator Barry Goldwater, in his book, With No Apologies, just flat stated that the Trilateral Commission is intended to be the vehicle for multinational consolidation of the commercial banking interest by seizing control of the political government of the United States. And in fact, that seems to be what exactly is going on right now is a merging of corporate uh, with federal government. Which brings us to George W. Bush. 
who I call a post turtle. Some of you say, what's a post turtle? Well, that's a term we have down in Texas. You're driving down a country road and you see a turtle perched up on top of a fence post. That's a post turtle. You know he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> you know somebody put him up to it. <laughs> and you know he can't do anything while he's up there. <laughs> and basically all he want to do is help the poor creature down. <laughs> post turtle. If it wasn't so serious about what's going on, it really would be pretty laughable. So now that tracks back to the even more secretive Council on Foreign Relations. This was formed in 1921 by a group of people in, that were including um, Colonel House, who was the right-hand man shadow to Woodrow Wilson. And their whole avowed purpose was to educate the American public on the desirability of global government. And why did they feel like they had to do that? Because they had already made their first attempt, the League of Nations, okay? But it didn't work. Why? Because the Senate of the United States said, I'm not sure we're ready to give up our national sovereignty. How many times have you heard the politicians in the last year talk about sovereignty? They don't talk about it, do they? For that matter, when's the last time you heard a national politician talk, refer to the republic? They don't talk about that much either, do they? And while we're here, let's stop and briefly, and I, uh, let's explain what I'm talking about here. Oh, all they talk about is democracy. Democracy, God save democracy. We love democracy. The terrorists hate democracy. Well, what is democracy? Democracy is ruled by the majority. What's the primary example of democracy in action? A lynch mob, okay? Everybody says lynch him, so they do. Folks, this is not what we were handed by our ancestors. This was never intended to be a pure democracy. What we are supposed to have in this country with its constitution, its bill of rights, is a, is a democratic republic. Now what's the difference? In a pure democracy, the lynch mob. Lynch him, okay? You string him up. In a democratic republic, you have to go through a system of laws, checks and balances, courtroom procedure. You have to give the guy a fair trial. There are certain procedures and laws that you have to follow. You have to, he has the right to meet his accuser. He has the right to defense. He has the right to cross-examine the evidence and the, and the uh, witnesses against him. And then if he's found guilty, then you can hang him, okay? That's what we're supposed to have. And this is not what we have now, is it? Now they can grab you, lock you up, and uh, if they decide, if one man, John Ashcroft, who, who's up until 9-11's whole claim to fame was throwing covers over the bare breast of statues <laughs> in Washington, D.C. because he was upset, no, oh, oh. Talk about a boob. <laughs> I didn't say that. But on his word alone, you can be declared an enemy combatant in hell without trial and without legal representation. They are stripping the liberties that we are guaranteed in this country. And it really is amazing to me because if Osama bin Laden was indeed behind the 9-11 attacks and there's still been no real proof that he is, but if he was and if his goal was to destroy a democracy and to end our freedoms, he succeeded, hadn't he? But we know that some bearded guy over in a cave somewhere is not responsible for everything that's going on in the world today. Who's responsible are these people, who's responsible are these people who have been working at this for hundreds of years. Uh, what's interesting is notice, oops, they just cut the graphic. Can we put the graphic back up real quick? If you'll notice, over here is the CFR logo with the rider on the horse and the Roman, uh, the uh, um, Latin inscription. And over here is a medallion of the ancient Knights Templars. Looks pretty close, doesn't it? Same deal. And the same objectives are going along. They consolidated all of this 
a long time ago with the formation of the CIA and with the National Security Act of 1947. The National Security Act of 1947 is really what began to sound the death knell for freedom and democracy in this country. It was signed on September the uh, 27th, I believe, of 1947, and uh, it's really interesting to see what happened there. Now, most of the uh, things with the National Security Act of 1947 we're all kind of familiar with. We know it separated the uh, Air Force from the Army as a separate branch of service. We know it created uh, the CIA. Uh, we know that it changed the words, uh, the title of the old War Department to the Defense Department, which is a pretty slick public relations move because if you go back and look at that old War Department, oh, who wants a War Department? But under the old War Department, we only fought three wars, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II. Under the Defense Department, where we're only going to defend ourselves, yeah, we got Korea, Vietnam, Kosovo, you know, Panama, you know, Grenada, uh, Laos, Cambodia, you know, Colombia, you name it. I think we need to go back to the War Department. <laughs> we didn't have near as many wars. But within these secret societies now, and everybody that's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, or everybody that's a member of the Trilateral Commission, they are not all sinister conspirators who are trying to take over the world, okay? A lot of them are just wannabes, you know? They want to be there, and they want to be taking over the world. Or actually, I would describe it this way. Remember when you were in grade school? And the thing you really wanted most out of life was to be able to sit at the table with the cool kids in the lunchroom. Boy, if I could just be with those cool kids, maybe I could get a date for Friday night, you know? That's what you really wanted. Well, these are the people who are globbed on to these secret societies. Most of them are not on the inner core elite. They are just wannabes and they like, their, they like to be next to the wealth and the power, okay? But within each of these societies, there is a handful of people that like, and one is David Rockefeller, he's in all of them, okay? Henry Kissinger, you know, there's certain ones who are at the inner core of all of these societies. They meet once a year uh, in a group known as the Bilderbergers. The Bilderbergers are so secretive that they don't even really have a name. They're called the Bilderbergers because they were first discovered by the public meeting at, uh, in um, um, Holland back in 1954. And they were founded by Prince Barnhard of the Netherlands who had uh, previously been a Nazi SS officer. And by the way, any of you all have Texaco gas cards? You do realize that Texaco is now bought by Shell. And Shell is the that's the royal family of Holland, the founders of the Bilderbergers. So the New World Order marches on. Of course, then we've got Skull and Bones. I think we all know that uh, Prescott Bush, the patriarch of the Bush family, and that uh, George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush are all members of the Skull and Bones. Now, there are some who argue that the Skull and Bones is the secret society behind the secret societies and that they run everything. I'm not convinced of that. There are plenty of people who have been inducted into the Skull and Bones and who have elected not to follow through on all their contacts and have gone on to live very respectable and, and good lives, okay? The Skull and Bones, however, is a springboard. That's where they take young men, they find the ones that with ability and more importantly, those that are compliant and they groom them to become world leaders. And all you have to do is just go study about the skull and bones and you'll find that there is an inordinate number of people who go on to take top government positions. Again, if this was really a free country, you'd think that we'd have some people from, you know, Southern Cal, University of Texas, Oklahoma, somebody, you know, there's gotta be some smart people around somewhere. But these folks are always the ones that end up in power. Also, it has been established that the skull and bones is actually the order 322. It is the 322nd chapter of the Illuminati. This was published in the New York Times. 
Now we get to the question of how come you don't know all this, and that gets back to the control over the media. First, you have to understand the media cannot control every, I mean, these people, these secret societies cannot control all the editors and all the reporters across the country. No, they control the media through the distribution of the information. Just in the past several months, there have been some massive anti-war demonstrations taking place in California, in Denver, in Washington. And most of you have heard little or nothing about them. And when you did hear about them, oh, 30,000 people, uh-uh, try 500,000. There have been massive demonstrations in England and in Germany, and you very rarely hear about that. This is because they control not the editors and publishers, but the distribution of the information. And how do they do that? I've listed two here, Time Warner and Disney. There's another couple that I could mention. Uh, Viacom is another one. The Venti is another one. Clear Channel is now buying up all of the radio stations in this country. Clear Channel bought up Premier Radio not long back, and now two of its leading voices, Whitley Strieber and Art Bell, are no longer with us. Okay? And who owns Clear Channel? Well, it's connected to the Carlisle Group. That's Henry Kissinger and the Bush family. Okay? So they are clamping down on the access to information. And never lose sight of the fact is I don't care how brilliant you are, if you make decisions based on faulty, erroneous, or incomplete information, you're not going to be making the right decision. At the top is a note that was written to James Tucker, who uh, used to write for the old Spotlight, now writes for the American Free Press, and he has tracked the Bilderbergers for years. And uh, this lady that was an ombudsman with the Washington Post sends him a note and says, well, if observations of the Bilderberg, the Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, Aspen Institute, et cetera, hold true, there's much that is ponderous, but little that is newsworthy. How's that for a condescending, unthinking response? Let me put it this way. What do you think the news media's reaction would be if all of the owners of the National Football League franchises were to meet in a big hotel secretly with armed guards all around it, won't let the media in, won't let anybody in, they meet there for about a week, and then they all come out and say, sorry, I can't tell you what we talked about. Whew. Would they blow their lid or what? They'd be yelling price fixing, collusion, restraint of trade, you know, blah, blah, blah. they'd raise hell. But you get the leaders of commerce and banking and industry, and they meet once a year, and they hide themselves off in some big, well-guarded resort, and they come out and say, we're not gonna tell you what we talked about. It makes a mockery of freedom of the press. It makes a mockery of freedom, period. We have got to start understanding who's really calling the shots, because until we understand what's really going on, how can we make any decisions or do anything about what's happening in our own country? I had to throw in this cartoon says well the CBS Viacom deal look at what you get movies MTV radio videos Nickelodeon news media theme parks billboards showtime just about every kind of entertainment and advertising you could want the guy says well what about the news and he goes, this is the news <laughs> this is the news think about it folks not long back, I'm sitting at home, and I don't watch TV that much, but I happen to have it on. They said that we're going to interrupt for a news, news break. I'm going, okay, good. I'll get to the headline news, kind of get caught up. There were four stories that they put out over this two-minute news break or whatever it is, and all four of them were sports stories. So-and-so won the Masters. You know, so-and-so won some football game, some baseball game. Don't get me wrong. I love sports, but sports are sports. They are not news. You can get all excited about the big game, but then next week it's over with and who cares? And what does it really matter? It doesn't. And that's what's masquerading, though, as news. Now these folks, it's already been said right here at this conference that these folks are really the big, brightest and the best, and they are more intelligent than we are. And it's only right and proper that they run everything because they only have our best interest at heart. Well, let's look back over just the past hundred years. 
They've given us two world wars, two depressions, one acknowledged and the one currently not. <laughs> and it doesn't sound like they're operating in our best interest. Not at all. They give us the Persian Gulf War. That was Daddy Bush's war. Drew his line in the sand. Just happened to be north of the, in the Harkin Energy holdings of, he, of his son, George W., who just by sheer coincidence, I'm sure, sold off the bulk of those holdings right before the invasion of Kuwait and made himself a, almost a cool million dollars by selling short on that. Think, you think Daddy might have whispered in his ear? Oh, no, I wouldn't do that, would they? Of course they would. And then the whole thing ends, just as everything's closing in. Got too much to cover here. I could give you the whole story. When the American ambassador goes to Saddam Hussein, April Glassby, and she testified to this in front of Congress but didn't go anywhere, he says, uh, we're going to go back to our original boundaries, which means he's going to take back Kuwait, which was illegally taken and carved out of uh, Iraq in the first place by the British years ago so they could uh, get their hands on some of those southern Iraqi oil reserves. And uh, he asked the American ambassador, you know, what do, what do you all think about that? And her almost exact answer was, well, uh, I've been instructed to inform you that we consider that an Arab problem and we don't really have any thoughts on that. What does that sound like? Sounds like do what you want to do. And then the minute he sends his troops into Kuwait, oh, he's the new Hitler. All right, and the Saudis put up a $12 billion war chest hidden in a secret account in, in London for George Bush to use to prosecute the Persian Gulf War. It's a deal, folks. It's just a deal. They're all just deals. This whole thing right now, I'll tell you what I suspect. We all know this thing from about Iraq is about oil. But why do we need the oil? We got plenty of oil in the United States and we're not getting that much out of the Middle East anyway. And besides that, we now have our troops in Afghanistan, which means we now control the Caspian Sea oil reserves. Something that's been a big bone of contention for the last hundred years, ever since the Nobel brothers went over there and started uh, uh, production in the Caspian Sea area. When Hitler sent his sixth army charging through the Ukraine, they weren't going to capture Stalingrad. They were trying to get to those Caspian Sea oil reserves, but they got stopped at Stalingrad. It's been a big bone of contention. Everybody wants to get a hold of Caspian Sea oil. Well, now we have it. And Britain now wants their share. They want the Iraqi oil. And it's really funny because we see Tony Blair uh, standing up and he's pushing for war with Iraq just about as hard as uh, George Bush. And we think, oh, our wonderful British allies, boy, they're with us through thick and thin. I think once you study these secret societies and where they came from and who's really behind all this, it's the other way around. BP wants the oil, but they can't move British troops into Iraq because quite correctly that would be perceived as aggression. But the United States has already fought a war with Iraq, so we can go in and take it for them. And y'all just hide and watch. If we have a war and we have a regime change and we get gain control over Iraq, you hide and watch if British Petroleum doesn't get a big chunk of that. It's all about oil. We all know that. And the problem is we're all so fat and sassy. We, well, yeah, but I got to have gas for my car, man. I got to drive down to the 7-Eleven and get a pack of cigarettes, you know. I mean, yeah, it's only a block away, but who wants to walk a block, you know? We are just really so, we just have no idea of uh, the misery in most of the world because we all have it so well. I mean, you know. So it's all about oil, and my big complaint there is, is we don't need the damn oil, okay? We don't need to be on a petroleum energy basis anyway. There's so much other things we could be doing. Uh, do you realize that with just some tweaking of the intake uh, jets in your carburetor, you could be running your car on hydrogen? And hydrogen does not cause any pollution. And hydrogen is the most plentiful substance on the planet. Think about it. This is a water planet. H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. We could be burning hydrogen. We don't even need the damn oil. But no, we're going to go over there and kill a whole bunch of people and probably our own troops. And look what's happening with the Gulf veterans right now. 
They're all coming down with all kinds of sicknesses, probably because of the contaminated vaccines they got. Also, the depleted uranium shells that were lying everywhere, giving them a radiation dose that destroys their immunization system, not to mention the, the oily smoke and petrochemicals hanging in the air. And do you think that a new war with Iraq's gonna be any better? Never mind the massive casualties that Iraq's going to suffer. Wait till our guys come back in another 20 years, and they'll be raising hell about their, their health problems. And uh, what's the government going to do about it? I'll tell you right now, not a damn thing. Let me tell you something. When I was in the Army, this just really gets my blood to boiling when I think about this. When I was in the Army back during Vietnam, we'd get sea rations, and in the sea rations, along with the powdered milk and the this and the other thing, was a little packet of cigarettes. You had five little cigarettes. We always thought that was cool, free cigarettes. And those who didn't smoke would swap them around to those who did, and they, it was almost a medium of exchange. And that practice goes way on back even through World War II. Where do you think all those guys in World War II got the smoking habits? Because the Army gave them free cigarettes. And now under the Clinton administration, when some of these guys who put their life on the line to fight for freedom and democracy in World War II, and they start coming down with emphysema and lung cancer, and they go to the VA under the Clinton administration, they ruled that that was a self-inflicted disease and that they would not treat the veterans. That's shameful, folks, that's shameful. You give your soldiers cigarettes all through their career and then you won't treat them when they get a health-related problem? Unconscionable, but that's what happens when you let these secret society creeps run your country. Going back past the Gulf War, and now we get back to Vietnam, and uh, Lyndon Johnson and his wise men, okay? He surrounded himself with about 12, 14 guys, and they were every one of them counsel on foreign relations. In fact, Vietnam, the thing I never could quite figure out is why were we fighting 9,000 miles away from the shores of the United States? Well, let me tell you why. Because right after World War II, the Council on Foreign Relations published some papers that were saying we needed to gain control over the mineral resources of Southeast Asia, which at that time was called French Indochina. All right, but then in the spring of 1954, the French got defeated at the Battle of Dinh Bien Phu, and they withdrew from French Indochina. Within weeks, John Foster Dulles, a founder of the Council on Foreign Relations, and who was then Secretary of State to Dwight Eisenhower goes to the Philippines and creates something called the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, CETO. And he later explained that he did that to give the American president the legal precedent for intervention in South, in Southeast Asia. That was the beginning of the whole thing. Now, is he acting on the best interest of the United States, or is he acting on the best interest of the Council on Foreign Relations that wanted control over those mineral resources? And of course, I don't have to tell you what happened. 58,000 American lives later, we finally slunk away with our tail between our legs, defeated by a bunch of guys in, in rubber sandals, thanks to the wise men. And in the middle of this, when our guys are dying in the jungles of Vietnam, Who's over in Russia but David Rockefeller meeting with Khrushchev? And, on the and, and with the insistence of David Rockefeller and his other powerful friends at the Council on Foreign Relations, they encouraged Lyndon Johnson to increase loans to Russia at levels higher than we did in World War II when they were our allies against Hitler. Now what does this mean? It means, folks, that while our sons and daughters and brothers and husbands were over there fighting for their lives in the jungles of Vietnam, we were told we had to do that because North Vietnam was a surrogate of China and Russia and that if we didn't stop them there, then it's the domino effect and they'd take over the Philippines and they'd take over Hawaii and they'd take over this country and we had to stop them right there. And that they were getting arms and ammunition from China and Russia and it was an anti-communist crusade. And to that extent, it was true. They were getting arms and ammunition and war materials from China and Russia. And Russia was getting loans from us. And they'd take our tax-supported money and they'd build facilities like the Kama River Truck Factory and they'd crank out war materials to ship to North Vietnam to use against our guys. Does that make any sense to anybody? But that's what goes on, folks, and it's still going on. And unless we start waking up, it's going to continue. 
if you stop and think about it, gunfire is pretty well decided every national election from 1964 to 1988. 64, Lyndon Johnson wins on the sympathy because of the JFK assassination. 68, Nixon wins after uh, uh, the uh, reaction to the Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy shootings. Then in 1972, uh, George Wallace looks like he's going to pull votes from Nixon and he's shot. 1976, Carter uh, uh, wins after there were assassination attempts on Gerald Ford. And then in 1980, Reagan is le elected after an assassination attempt on Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter? You don't remember the assassination attempt on Jimmy Carter? Why, well, he had asked for national TV time in the late spring of 1979, and he was going to announce some sweeping changes in government, including curtailing the CIA. But then he goes to Los Angeles, and he's attacked by Raymond Lee Harvey and Oswaldo Ortiz. So Lee Harvey and Oswaldo were going to kill him in Los Angeles. There it is. You saw it in the Newsweek article. But you don't remember that, do you? Because it didn't get distributed in the news media. And right after that, he canceled his national TV talk, went to seclusion at Camp David, called in everybody up to and including Billy Graham, and said, I've lost control of the government. And he was out. And Reagan was in. And two months after Reagan was elected, he shot. And if that bullet had been that much closer, it had hit his heart, and we would have had George Bush eight years earlier. People don't think about that, do they? Oh, well, I just I guess that's a conspiracy theory. Speaking of, you're going to love this one, the Reagan shooting. All network tapes, clearly, you can clearly hear the sound of seven shots. Bam, 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 bam. Hinkley had a six-shot revolver. How do you get seven shots out of a six-shot revolver? And where did it come from? Up there, circling red, the bullet that struck Reagan, was it a downward trajectory? Go back and check the media. They, they accurately reported that. And Hinckley, though, is standing level with him over here in the crowd, back over here beyond that policeman. Up here is a sliding glass door with a human figure crouched behind that door. Was this the person who actually shot Reagan? We don't know because there's never any investigations because all that's just conspiracy theory. But of course, Reagan was shot, and for months, the person who was really in charge was George Herbert Walker Bush. You're going back to Korea. You find out that Russian generals were running the Korean War on both sides. Does that make any sense? And yet the bulk of the Allied troops was our guys. United States military supported by our tax dollars. We're really being taken, folks. Go all the way back to World War II. Again, I, I noticed it was mentioned here at this conference that, well, uh, everything would have been okay except Hitler was the bad guy, and, and he, he kind of screwed everything up. Well, let me tell you, folks, do your homework. Hitler didn't just suddenly appear. Hitler, number one, was a military intelligence agent who was assigned to infiltrate the Nazi party. And he went back to his superiors and said, well, there's a, went to this meeting, there's only about nine guys there, but you'd like them because they want to rebuild Germany and they hate the Jews and they want to they rearm and they want to repudiate the Versailles Treaty. So his superior said, ah, that sounds pretty good. Here's some money, go back and help out. So they created Hitler. And then as he began to gain more power, who was behind him? Another secret society, the Thule Gesellschaft, or the Thule Society, made up of some of the leading industrialists, leading intellectuals in Germany at the time. People, and also people who had an intimate working knowledge of the occult. All right? So now we can see that all of these secret societies have been working along. And it was the same thing back during World War I. Same people ran World War I. It's amazing, but, uh, but uh, at the time of the Russian Revolution, where was Lenin? He wasn't in Russia. He was in Switzerland. Where was uh, Leon Trotsky, the, the communist philosopher, key philosopher? 
He wasn't in Russia. He was in New York City working for Wall Street capitalists. And they gave him money and they gave him uh, all kinds of support to go into Russia and take over a popular uprising and change it into a communist government. Lenin was the same thing. We all know that he was put on a sealed railroad car and traveled through wartime Germany that was at war with Russia and was sent on into Russia to take over the government and set up the communist system. And one of the people who helped facilitate that was a leading banker in Germany who also was very highly connected with German intelligence, and that was a fellow by the name of Max Warburg. Now, don't you find it passing strange that in World War I, Max Warburg, who was head of German intelligence and a big leading banker there in Germany, his brother, Paul Warburg, founded the Federal Reserve System in our country and at that time was head of the, of the financial end of World War I for the United States of America. Does nobody find that amazing? Here he is, Paul Warburg. And, and here's the house on Jekyll Island where the plans were laid to instill upon us the Federal Reserve System which is neither federal nor has any reserves, all right? It is a system of 12 banks. <laughs> it's a system of 12 banks that are in turn owned by other private banks. And in fact, most of the studies that have been done show that the majority of ownership in the banks that control the Federal Reserve are held by people who are not even Americans. Think about that one. I could get into money and the whole thing, but let's keep going. Here's the original Federal Reserve Board, and there's, my, there's old Paul. He headed up the original Federal Reserve Board. And here we see Woodrow Wilson and Colonel House and his wife. And this is where it begins to tie into the older secret societies, because as I've pointed out, Trilateral Commission connects to the CFR, the Intercorps leadership is Bilderberger. The CFR was created right after World War I by Colonel House, Bernard Baruch, and others to try to sell us on the idea of globalization. And these folks had been members of the old uh, Cecil Rhodes uh, secret society called the Round Tables. Here is a cartoon from 1911 showing Karl Marx shaking hands with uh, J.P. Morgan, George Perkins, Teddy Roosevelt, John Ryan of National City Bank, John D. Rockefeller, and Andrew Carnegie. They financed communism. They created it. Why? So they could play both ends against the middle. Think of Cold War. And now it's over with. And think of the billions of dollars that were squandered on that Cold War. Think of what this country could be today if we'd spent that money building schools and upgrading education, upgrading health facilities. No, 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 that was not going to make them money. So see, back in 1911, those old folks knew better about what was really going on than we do today. And this is just a little graphic showing the New World Order and how that it tracks on down. You can take a look at that. I do want to mention the Hegelian dialectic. That sounds pretty fancy, but basically all it is is just um, action response and then synthesis, synthesis, whatever you work out. You all do this all the time. You and your wife or husband decide you want to go to the movies. One of you says you want to go see movie A. The other one says, no, I don't want to see that. I want to see movie B. Okay, well the one who wants to see movie A, that's thesis. That's his thesis or her thesis. One says, I want to see movie B, that's antithesis or antithesis, the antithesis. Okay, now then you work it out. If you're like me and my wife, what we usually do is end up going seeing movie C, <laughs> which is second choice for both of us, but it's one we can agree on. That is synthesis, and that's how it works. And, and all Hegel did was simply kind of work out this formula for human interaction. But where the secret society folks took a leg up on it is, is they figured out you don't have to wait for a problem and then offer it a solution and then how it works out is what you get. You create a problem. 
You create a problem, then you offer the solution, and then whatever's worked out, you got it. When the Murrah Federal Building was bombed, they had anti-terrorist legislation pending in Congress, and some of it was pretty draconian. They, it was going to just shred the Constitution, and most people were going, wait a minute, I, I don't know, I don't know. They weren't going for it, and it was hung up. It wasn't going anywhere. Boom, Federal Building in Oklahoma blows up. I'm not going to go into that, but most of you know there's a whole lot more there than Timothy McVeigh and his little fertilizer bomb, okay? But boom, it goes up. All right, now you got a problem. And what's the solution? Got to pass all this anti-terrorism legislation. So then, but then that's a problem. So what's the solution? Well, you, you work on it, you water it down, and it, it still got passed. Not to the extent they originally wanted, but it got passed. And it's the same thing that we knew the communists did for years. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. This stuff they've rammed through over the past year, Homeland Security, Patriot Act, you hide and watch as the years drove on, unless, unless they pump us up again with some other terrorist act, which they're liable to if we start balking at everything, but courts will begin to throw some of that stuff out and the thing will start coming back into balance. Already there are 60 cities in the United States that have passed ordinances that uh, are ordering their local police and, and law enforcement people not, not to enforce Homeland Security and Patriot Act provisions because they're unconstitutional. Of course, you don't hear much about that through the mass control corporate media, but it's happening, and there will be a backlash. It will come, and things will balance out a little bit, but see, it's already on the books. And, one, and this Homeland Security thing, once you create that whole level of bureaucracy, I guarantee it'll never go away. The CIA is a good example. That was intended to be exactly what it says, the Central Intelligence Agency. It was going to be a small agency that was going to take the intelligence from the Army and the Air Force and the Navy and everybody else and, and coordinate it. And it was, it was intended to stop uh, duplication of effort. And instead it created a whole monster that we're still having to deal with, okay? And it'll never go away. Homeland Security will never go away. We should never have passed it in the first place, but there was no debate, no talk. They got Homeland Security the night they got, they, it started off, it was a 30 page thesis saying here's what we probably need to do. And by the time it got to Congress, it was 500 pages and they got it the night before the vote. Now folks, I don't care how smart you are, you can't read 500 pages, absorb it, and think about it and make an intelligent decision. And I'll tell you, for that one fact alone, and I'm not even going to argue the merits of Homeland Security, but for the mere fact that your representatives passed a law that they hadn't even read, I think should be cause enough for a recall. You ought to throw every one of them out. Because what's the first thing a lawyer will tell you? Never sign anything until you've read it. And these guys passed the Patriot Act and the Homeland Security, and they didn't even read it. They had no idea what they were passing. Does any of you all remember back about 1997 or 1998, there was a little furor that got going over something called a, a, a banking program called Know Your Customer. Anybody remember that? Yeah, yeah, and the whole idea was is that your bank was going to have to turn around and be a snitch to the federal government. If, you were to, if your deposits somehow were a little bit different than the, the normal or if you withdrew an inordinate amount of money or whatever, they were going to report you, be required to report you, and they were going to keep massive personal information files, okay? Your wife, your family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, but that kind of got public and everybody went, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not going to put up with that. And sure enough, they kind of backed off and we all thought, we all felt real good, right, that they didn't get that through. It's in Homeland Security. It's in there. It's happening. And you never got to vote on it, did you? You can go all the way back to the war between the states or where I come from, we call it the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> but it was a deal. It was all a deal. August Belmont, a registered agent of the Rothschild banking family in Europe, came to this country and quickly became the leading seller of bonds for the federal government. 
He's the one that got the money to prosecute the war between the states. At the same time, he was quietly buying up all the southern bonds. It was a deal. Even Chancellor Bismarck of Germany is on the record as saying that the war in the, in the uh, 1860s in the United States was contrived by the Rothschilds to split the country in half so that they could regain North America for the bankers in France and Britain. And if you'll stop and think about it, where was the bulk of the British Army? It was in Canada. Where was the French Army? Anybody? Mexico, under Maximilian. So they were going to let the North and South bleed each other dry, and then they were going to move in. There's only one man who seemed to understand what was going on, and that was the head Yankee, Abraham Lincoln. I'll have to give him some grudging credit. I think he understood what was happening. And that's why he became the first American president to print his own money, known as greenbacks. Do you know there's only been one other president in the history of this country that tried to print interest-free money? John F. Kennedy. June 1963, he ordered the issuance of $6 billion in currency, not through the Federal Reserve System, but through the United States Treasury. I have a $5 note. It says series 1963. It's got red ink on it. It says United States note. It doesn't say Federal Reserve note. And I don't think it's a coincidence that both of those presidents were shot in the head. So now we can see what I call my pyramid of power. That's us down at the bottom. <laughs> the poor, long-suffering public. Over us is the low-level political structure. There's your local city council, school board, and stuff, most of whom are good people trying to do a difficult job. A few snakes in there, but, you know, as we learned in the Army, there's always 2% that won't go along with the program and your mass media. And this thing maybe that disturbs me most about the mass media having worked in it, it's not that they're bad, it's not that they're liberal, it's not that they're conservative, it's that they're dumb and they're lazy, okay? They don't want to work, so they will not go out and really pursue a story or look past the superficial explanation. They just take the government handout and they run with it. And this really bothers me because, you know, I think, think about it in our own personal life. Um, if, if you have a good friend and you find that friend is lying to you, then that upsets you. And, but that's a friend, so you try to forgive them and you try to rationalize and think, well, maybe they just didn't understand. Then you, get, then you catch them lying to you again. Well, now it's going, boy, I don't know. Third or fourth time they lie to you, they're no longer your friend, are they? You, I, you just say, I don't want to have anything to do with that person. He's a liar. Well, the government has got caught lie after lie after lie after lie, and still they come out and say something, and the news media just runs with it as if that's the gospel. And then it takes six months, six years, 40 years for us to find out that it was all a big lie. Then you come on up to your military intelligence agencies and your high-level political structure. Then you come on up to the multinational corporations and the, the, the hub of the New World Order, the United Nations, and it's now military arm, NATO. Okay, and then you come on up through the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and you notice they're not even at the top of the pyramid, because you get up higher, and it even gets higher, and then you get up to the, John Coleman calls the Committee of 300, others call the Illuminati, and then you got a big question mark, because who's telling those people what to do? Now we start into real history. I'm not going to really belabor you about Freemasonry, other than to tell you that you might want to be aware that the first third party in the United States was the anti-Masonic party. And they broke the back of Masonic Freemasonry or Freemasonry back in the early 1800s and it never quite recovered until after the Civil War. Within Freemasonry, the, uh, this isn't my theory, this is what Masonic historians and writers will tell you if they're honest. There's a huge outer circle well, first, let me say this. There's a tremendous difference between European Freemasonry and American Freemasonry. The, Nor the European Freemasonry is much more sinister and has much more ties to, uh, to politics and to the Illuminati. 
but the American, North American Freemasonry is much more of a kind of a fraternal order, and they do great things. Their burn centers are wonderful. But within Freemasonry on, in both sides of the ocean, there's an outer circle, and then there's a little inner core circle that knows what's really going on and what their agenda really is. Now don't bother to ask a Masonic friend if that's true because he will tell you no. And that's because he's either part of the outer circle, in which case he really truly does not know that there's an inner circle, or he's part of the inner circle, in which case he's taken a blood oath never to reveal that, okay? But Freemasonry is where a lot of these thoughts, ideals, and knowledge has been passed along because the men who made up Cecil Rhodes' roundtables, which were the progenitors of the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral, etc., were illuminized Freemasons. They were Freemasons who had been instilled with the knowledge and with the agendas of the Illuminati. And what was that? Where did they think they got all this from? Well, here's Manly Wade Hall, uh, a philosopher, a much studied occultist, and, and a very high-ranking mason. And he says, in the Roanoke past, the gods walked with men, and they chose from among the sons of God the wisest and the truest. And these they labored with, preparing them to carry on the work of the gods after the spiritual hierarchies themselves had withdrawn into the invisible worlds. With these specially ordained and illumined sons, they left the keys of their great wisdom. These illumined ones founded what we now know as the ancient mysteries. George Washington, big Masonic. So they're passing along the ancient mysteries through Freemasonry. By the way, if you think that the Illuminati is just something you can laugh at and just some kind of boogaboo, here's a letter in 1782 from George Washington where he said, it was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati had not spread to the United States. On the contrary, no one is more fully satisfied of that fact than I am. These guys knew more about what was going on than we do today with all our modern technology and all our electronic communications. Uh, we could, I could spend a whole program talking about Washington, D.C. and the layout of the streets and how it was all built by Masons and that how the, uh, f the uh, floor plan, ground street plan of Washington parallels Virgo, which has always been associated with the Egyptian goddess Isis, okay? So these people, and by the way, if, you, if you're not aware of this, some of you are, some of you aren't. Every time there's a space launch, okay, there is, it's always at a certain time and in a certain manner to conform with astrological numbers, okay? Somebody somewhere still has a great concern about the stars and what's happening. All right, there in, in Washington, D.C., there are 23 major zodiacs in that city, more than any other city in the world. One other thing you're going to love, I don't think it's nothing on this map. In the earliest plat of Washington, D.C., all the lots are numbered except one. You get up to uh, 665, and then it jumps to 667, 668. So what's missing? 666, 666. And guess what sits on that lot today? The capital of the United States. Now it's accepted by historians that the French Revolution was fomented by the Illuminati. And here's a picture of Adam Weishaupt who founded the Bavarian Illuminati and he was only carrying on traditions and knowledge that came from either even much older uh, uh, things. And I think it would be worth quickly to look at the 10 steps offered by Karl Marx in his Communist Manifesto. And if you'll compare this to Illuminati writings, you'll find that their goals have always been the same. And, and as I read these, I want you to think about where we are in this country today in relation to this topic. Abolition of private property. Not there yet, but they're working on it. Now we got wet zones and United Nations zones and whatever. A progressive or graduated income tax. Well, we got that. Abolition of all inheritance. They're working on that. Confiscation of property of dissidents and immigrants. Homeland Security's got that taken care of. Creation of a monopolistic central bank. Well, that was done back in 1913. 
centralize all communication and transport. Well, see, when Karl Marx offered this, he was thinking in terms of state control. Today, it's corporate control. And instead of the state running the corporations, today, I think in this country, it's the other way around. Control of all factories and farm production. Again, corporate control. Central ownership of capital with deployable workforce. That's us. Oops, got to, got to move from Silicon Valley. No more jobs. We've got to go somewhere else. Blur the distinction between rural country and cities. Boy, that's being done. I moved to the country 22 years ago. It was a wonderful little place. Now I go down there, there's McDonald's, Sonic, Krispy Kreme donut shop. You know, might as well be in Fort Worth or Dallas. Free public education for all children, which on the surface of it sounds like a wonderful idea, and I'm all for it. I think every single kid, no matter where he comes from, no matter what color he is, no matter what, should have a shot at learning the, the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But folks, that's it. After that, if he has aptitude, he should be able to go on. If he doesn't, he should go to trade schools. This thing, the education has turned into a huge monster. And look what's going on in education today. And look what, you stop and check what they're being taught. And, and today, they're not even being taught. It, it, what's important is they have to feel good about themselves. That's why we, they're trying to do away with grading systems. That's why they're trying to do away with the SATs and all like that. Well, we don't want somebody feeling left behind because they, they can't pass those tests. We want them to feel good about themselves. Well, all I can say is how good about themselves they're going to feel when they're 50 years old and all they can do is sit on the street corner and sell pencils. You know, you got to have that education. And they're not getting it. The, the dumbing down of America is not just a catchword. It is actually happening. So all of these things that were advanced by the Illuminati long before uh, even uh, Karl Marx are all agendas that are still being pushed along on us. And where did they come from? They came from the Knights Templars who built these wonderful cathedrals such as Chartres that has stained glass in it that is so luminous that modern science cannot explain how they do that. Here's some of the stained glass from, uh, the, from charts, and you can also see the, uh, the uh, similarities between the charts at the bottom and uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda mosque in Jerusalem's Temple Mount. They brought back knowledge from the Middle East. Again, look at the striking similarities between these Egyptian uh, artifacts and artifacts in, in Jerusalem. Uh, you've got a black Madonna that you still find in southern France compared to uh, Isis. Uh, over here you've got the winged uh, person from uh, Egypt and another one that was found in a 9th century B.C. Jewish palace. It's all the same information, folks. It's all the same. We've been taught that here's all these different empires and civilizations. It's all a continuation. Uh, this is a great one. At the top, of course, you can see the famous Egyptian winged disc that Sitchin and others says probably represents the planet Nibiru. <laughs> and in bottom is a crop circle. Probably a hoax one, but it uh, shows that somebody's still thinking in terms of the winged disc. Now this brings us to the mystery of Rennes Le Chateau. And for those of you that have read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the Messianic Legacy and all like that, they go into this in great detail, but they never really, really quite just tell you what it really is, other than the fact that there apparently is some fabulous treasure buried over in the, in the caverns and cave systems that honeycomb the foothills of the Pyrenees there in southern France. And I was there two years ago, and it is an amazing place. It really is, and the stories are all there. Poussin, the artist, apparently was on to some of these secrets because in this painting up here, circling red, he seems to be giving us a fleeting glimpse of what? The Ark of the Covenant. So there's, some, there's all of this knowledge that's being passed along. Here, here is, the, again, the, the Masonic and Zodiacal uh, street plans of Washington compared to the same, you see the same geometric designs being used to build Rensselaer Chateau. Again, we see the same knowledge being passed down. Here's what you probably don't realize. 
Ranzelais Chateau is on the far left corner over here, and if you connect these holy sites, you have a geometric pentagram that encompasses a 40-mile circumference area. Any of you that have read Maurice Shaitlin's book know about the Maltese cross that is in the Aegean Sea that you can only connect by getting a map and connecting these sacred sites. Again, ancient knowledge passed along. Some of it, it lost, some of it gets distorted, but it's all coming down through the secret societies. And where did it all start? It started in southern Iraq also known as Mesopotamia. In the Bible, it's referred to as the Chaldees or Chaldea. Now, one of the tragic things of the, of the uh, turmoil that's going on in the Middle East is the fact that what you actually have are cousins, family people fighting each other because the Arabs trace their lineage back to the biblical patriarch Abraham. And the Jews trace their heritage back to the biblical patriarch Abraham. So they're all related but they can't get along. If we could go back to that, uh, to the map. The Bible tells us that Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. So he was not a Jew. He was not even a Semite. He was a Sumerian. And he had knowledge from the ancient Sumerian culture. And he brought that knowledge where? To Egypt. This is where the, the great Egyptian civilization got started with the knowledge that was brought out of Mesopotamia. Now we get to the question, and now the rest of it, more knowledge was brought by Moses. Except who was Moses? There is a very cogent argument to be made that, that Moses, is, M Moses is not a name, it's a title. Moses, meaning the pretender to the throne, the one true heir. And now we go and we look at the story of Moses. Oh, he was hidden away as a baby. He was placed in a basket of bulrushes, floated down the river to uh, relatives, raised by foster parents, educated as an Egyptian, believed in the one true God. Now you know what? If you go back and study about Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV, you find that it's the same story. <laughs> Hidden away as a baby, placed in a basket of bull rushes, floated down the river, raised by foster family. The foster family were Hebrew slaves. Well, you all know, any of you all who have adopted or are adopted or are, are adopting children, your real parents are who raise you, not who gives birth to you. Okay? We all know this. So Amenhotep is raised by Hebrews who instill in him the idea of the one true God. And when he assumes the uh, throne as Pharaoh, he changes his name to Akhenaten, meaning the one who worships, worships Atim, the one true God. And in the, even in the Bible, it says he was an Egyptian of, you know, or had great knowledge of Egypt, was very powerful in Egypt. How's a Hebrew slave get that? So now that whole story takes on a whole different coloration. And when he leads when he is th overthrown because he's shaken up the, the, the religious hierarchy of the day, which was making tons of money because everybody had to pay homage to all the various gods, they didn't like that, so they overthrew Akhenaten and they banished him. And when he left, he took his family with him, the Israelites or the Hebrews. And he was, they considered him still the one true king or Moses. But whether or not that's true, we find again that all of the information flows from um, Iraq or Samaria into Egypt. And of course we know that from Egypt then all this knowledge was centered in the ancient mystery schools of Egypt, which then went on to the ancient mystery schools of Greece and then on into the Romans, and this was our Western heritage. Now, all of this was accumulated, regardless of who Moses was, whether he was a, a title or a name, when the Israelites were sent out of Egypt and freed, they were told to take what you need. Well, some of them 
I'm sure that meant take some clothing, take some food, but some of them meant take everything that wasn't nailed down. And they took gold, silver, they took scrolls, they took all kinds of things on their travels in the wilderness. And we know that during their travels in the wilderness, they attacked and conquered a variety of people and city-states. And as was the habit in that time, oops, are we out of time? Oh, thank God, I saw something here. Okay, good, we're on track. I gotta wrap this up though, because I know you're gonna have some questions. So I'll make it quick. So they got this vast treasure hoard, gold, silver, but they've also got knowledge passed down from uh, Samaria. And I'm sure they got tired of lugging all this through the desert. So at one point, Solomon built a huge temple. And part of it, of course, was to worship. Part of it was to house the Ark of the Covenant, their communication device for God, and to house and warehouse all of this fabulous treasure. So what happened to it? Interestingly enough, when the Romans took Palestine, they didn't just move in and conquer it. They, uh, they worked a deal. They said, look, if you'll let us, uh, you can keep your king and you can keep your lifestyle if you'll just pay homage to Rome. And they said, okay, and King Herod was installed, built his palace over the old, at the same place as the old Solomon Temple there on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which is now, of course, a Muslim mosque, the Dome of the Rock. Um, but then the Jews began to chafe under the Roman leadership, and uh, in 66 AD there was a revolt. I'm sure it didn't just start overnight and it didn't end overnight. The Romans then sent troops in and they conquered the whole thing. Well, when they came in, they sacked Jerusalem and they sacked the temple. Uh, King Herod's palace at that time, formerly the, the Temple of Solomon. But they didn't get everything because the Jews knew what were happening and they took everything they could and they buried it under the temple in a series of cave systems and stuff and they carefully hid it away from the Romans. But the Romans nevertheless got a good portion of it, maybe even half or something, but they got a good portion. And what did they do with it? Well, they took it as booty back to Rome. 400 years later, Alaric the Goth sacks Rome. And again, as the way it happens, they took everything out of there. They took what the treasure, of some, half the treasure of Solomon, and they took it back to their home stomping grounds, which was where? The Landioc region of southern France. And they hid it in the cave systems down there. And this was both the wealth, treasure, and particularly the information and knowledge that was passed along to a group of people that became known as the Cathars. And the Cathars then were a thorn in the side of the Roman church because they had straight information. They had information that went contrary to what the Roman church was trying to put out, and that's why they never went along with their program. This, of course, gave rise to the Albigensian Crusade, where the Pope sent a papal army through the Landioc region and murdered everybody that was suspected of being a Cathar. That's where the expression got started, by the way, when they besieged the town of Braziers. Uh, they sent a message back to the Pope and said, how are we going to know the Cathars from everybody else? And the Pope is supposedly told him, he said, well, kill them all and let God sort them out. And we've heard that same quote. I heard that during Vietnam. You know, how do we tell the VC from the Vietnamese? Kill them all, let God sort them out. So this, uh, but they didn't, obviously they didn't kill all the Cathars. Some of the wealthy families there in southern France were Cathars. And they knew because they had access to this knowledge that the rest of the treasure of Solomon is buried over beneath Herod's palace in Jerusalem. So they fomented the Crusades, ostensibly to retake the Holy Land, but in reality these French families, the uh, Blanchards and, uh, uh, and uh, St. Bernard and these folks, they knew this treasure was over there and they wanted it. And so sure enough, in 1099 they conquered Jerusalem, and who shows up but nine knights from southern France, all connected to these Cathari families, and they say, we want to form a new military order called the Knights of the Temple. And so King Baldwin says, okay. And so he, he uh, allows them to form the Knights Templar. And they were supposed to be guarding the roads there, but they never did. What they did was excavate under the 
uh, temple and regained the rest of the treasure of Solomon. Again, not only a treasure of gold, silver, and precious stones, but a treasure of knowledge. And they hauled it from Jerusalem back through Rome and back into the Londiac region. And now at this point, the treasure of Solomon is reunited and hidden away in southern France in the area of rennes la chateau That's what the mystery is all about. That's the treasure. Now whether Father Saunier ever actually found the treasure is open to question. I suspect not. But he knew that that's what it was all about. He knew that this was in the right area and that's why he was suddenly wealthy and all the strange things went on with rennes la chateau And the, this was just a picture of the knights uh, that they showing their Maltese cross. And of course, then the Pope goes after the Knights Templars because he knows that they have dangerous information plus wealth. What happened to the reunited wealth near Rensselaer Chateau? In March of 1944, Otto Scorzini, the guy in the cap with the binoculars, leads a battalion of SS troops to southern France. Working off of the notes and, and publications of a German named Otto Rahn, who had been to rennes la chateau several times in the 20s and 30s and had working closely with Heinrich Himmler and his SS group that was heavy involved in the occult, they felt like they knew where the treasure was. And on March the 16th, 1944, uh, they send uh, the Germans into the, they couldn't do it before then because southern France was part of Vichy France uh, and, uh, and technically was supposed to be free France and they didn't want to cause any more tr trouble. But in September of 43, uh, Rome fell and Mussolini was deposed and at the same time that the Germans rescued Mussolini off the mountaintop, they also uh, poured into southern France and took over the whole country. So now they're able to freely operate in France, and they sent troops down there in March of 44. He sends a one-word one word telegram back to Berlin on March the 16th that says, Eureka, I found it. The greatest, most fabulous treasure in the history of the world, both of riches and of knowledge, is now in the hands of the Nazis. They took it back to Burstis Garden, which you can see the diagram here has an underground labyrinth of hidden systems and caves and bunkers and everything else. But it probably did not remain there. It was taken out of Germany on something called Auktionadlerflut or Operation Eagle Flight. This was instigated in August of 1944 by the head of the German Central Bank and the head of the IG Farben Combine and Martin Bormann, who by that time was running the show. Hitler was pretty much over the edge with megalomania plus all the drugs that he was being fed. These guys took the combined wealth of Europe that they had looted plus Solomon's treasure and they created 750 corporations all around the world. Their connecting banks were the Bank of International Settlements, the Deutsche Bank, which today is still a powerhouse in the financial world, Chase Bank, which later became Chase Manhattan, and I particularly want you to notice Union Banking Corporation. Because in 1942, one of the chief stockholders of the Union Banking Corporation was prosecuted in this country by the Justice Department under the Trading with the Enemies Act and they accused him of being nothing but a financial front man for Hitler and the Nazis. And that man was Prescott Bush and also his father-in-law, George Herbert Walker. So when you hear people say that these people running the country today are a bunch of neo-Nazis, I want you to stand up and say that is not so. There's nothing neo about them. They're the real old Nazis. <laughs> And the attorneys for the Schroeder Bank, which was one of the chief connecting banking operations, was a law firm in New York, uh, Sullivan and Cromwell, and their leading attorneys who worked with the Nazis was John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles. 
John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State under Eisenhower, the guy that brought us the Vietnam War, and Alan Dulles, of course, who was one of the longest running CIA directors who then sat on the Warren Commission to determine what happened to John Kennedy. All roads lead back to Sumar. You hear about the Babylonian civilization, the Akkadian civilization, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These were nothing more than just de-evolution of the original Sumerian civilization, and I'm not going to bore you with that, although if we could get the graphic back up, uh, you, you might want to notice that in this ancient steel up here, circling red, this, this dates back about three or 4,000 years before the Bible was ever written down, and it correctly shows the size and placement of the planets in the solar system. How'd they know that? Well, of course, we know how they know that. I'm not going to get into this. This is Sitchin's material. Others are now finding this out. 425,000 years ago, the Anunnaki came to Earth. And we know this because it was written down in ancient tablets that are still in existence. But where are they? Most of them are in Iraq, the one place you can't go. And I'm, we'll skim through this. You know, most of you know the story of the Anunnaki, okay, and how that there was wars broke out between them. We also know that they claim that they took a primitive earth female, shall we call her Lucy, and uh, they manipulated her DNA, did some genetic engineering, and came up with a worker race, which I think goes far to explain the absence of the missing link. There is no missing link. He had Neanderthal, and then his DNA genetic makeup was tweaked, and then you had Cro-Magnon, modern man. Uh, we could go into the similarities of the names and the writings, but let's rush on through. It's also interesting that the ancient Sumerian tablets also give the exact same account of the biblical flood with the only notable exception. There's two, two notable exceptions. One is that, of course, in the Bible, his name is Noah, and in the ancient Sumerian tablets, his name is uh, Utnap Pishkin or something like that. The one thing I find that's a little bit different too, but really brought a light bulb over my head, I had always had trouble with this idea of two of every animals on board this ship. <laughs> but I did figure out where they went to the bathroom. <laughs> on the poop deck. <laughs> no, that's, that's terrible. But I never really could figure out. All of you know, they got lions and tigers and sh sheep and goats, and they're all there side by side. I, how could that work? Well, in the ancient Sumerian tablets, it doesn't say they took two of every animal. It says they took the seed of every living thing. Whoops, hello. Now I see instead of a boatload of animals, you've got one little closet on board this ark that has DNA tissue in it, and they can reconstruct all of the, and you know that's going on right now? Do you know that they are right now, they are storing away DNA tissue on plants, animals, everything on this planet. So if, if there is some sort of huge cataclysm that they hopefully can rebuild everything. Now what's also interesting to me is that a lot of, how many of y'all are like Celtic music and, and uh, all this good stuff? Yeah, it's kind of a fad right now. Are you aware that the Celts and the Druids did not originate in the British Isles? They migrated from Iraq, Mesopotamia. In fact, there were two mass migrations. One went up through the Caucasus Mountains, came in through Eastern Europe, ended up over on the British Isles. They were known as the Druids. And the primitive people who were there that worshiped them because they had knowledge, they knew things, they knew how to do things. And of course the other came into Egypt and from Egypt to Greece, and from Greece to the Romans and then on into the Western civilization. In fact, the whole history of Western civilization has been one constant movement to the West. And when Europe filled up and the British Isles filled up, then they came to America and the East Coast filled up. And during the 1800s it was one mass migration from the East Coast to the West Coast, and why? Why do these people keep moving? Historians, it's no mystery. They, they, they all say, they all admit why. To escape religious and political tyranny. In other words, in other words, somebody's been trying to get a hold of us 
all of this time, but we're like trying to grab mercury or something. You know, you're trying to grab it, well, move, <laughs> move some more. We just, had, but you know what, folks? We got a problem. There's no place else to move. And now they've got technology. And they know where everybody is. So here's just a brief rundown. You can see that you start with the ancient Samaria and you can trace the knowledge and the attempt to control humanity right on up. And it's all the same thing. The, the Pharaohs, the Caesars, the royalty of Europe, Hitler. What were they concerned with? The bloodline and the interbred. And they want to maintain the purity of the blood. There's something about that and it tracks all the way back. So now, if we assume that these ancient t tablets are telling us the truth and that these spacefaring aliens landed on the planet all these thousands of years ago, then that begs the question. Did they all leave? Or did they all, or at least a portion of them, stay behind? It's an either or thing. They either all left or, they, or some of them or all of them stayed behind. So which is it? I think we can find the answer. And we find the answer by looking at the historical record. If they all left, the whole written history of mankind should be just one unending, gradual evolution up to civilization. You know, hunter-gatherers to city-states to nations and on like that, with nothing in the record to show that there was anything strange or unusual going on. But that's not what we find, is it? Quite the contrary. The historical record gives us the answer. It's the great Los Angeles air raid. If you look closely, you can see the saucer caught in the, in the uh, searchlights. Got pictures of saucers over the desert. You've got an ancient fringe coin from the 1600s that shows a giant wheel-shaped object floating over the countryside. You've got alien autopsy. You've got the triangles. You've got a Billy Meyer picture over here in the crop circles and, of course, the occult that's been with us all the time, which is just strangeness that nobody knew how else to explain. And of course, all of the sightings of UFOs, cattle mutilations, the whole thing. Somebody's still here. But if they're still here, then what's going on? I feel like there's three possibilities because we have clearly established that there is a small ruling elite that wants to rule the world. And we've also established that these ancient astronauts apparently are still around, at least some of them are. So this leads to three possibilities. Either the ruling elite are trying to contact these ancient creators, or number two, they've already contacted these ancient creators and are being controlled or guided by them. Or number three, they are the ancient creators, the ancient serpent kings of legend the ones who have been trying to corral and control humanity from the get-go. And now they're getting close to realizing this because now they have the technology to do it. So now we have to ask ourselves, these people, these same bloodlines, these same people, the, what are the odds that the Bushes, who is the leader of the free world, and the Windsors, who are the lead, leaders of the, what's left of the British Empire, what's the odds that, that these, these two families that are blood related, so you're actually talking about one family, are, are running the, the Western civilization? What are the odds of that? More details in Rule by Secrecy, and I thank you for your time, and I hope I've helped put some of this together for you. I don't think we have much time left, but, but anybody has an important question, come to the microphone and I'll try to answer it. Yes, Colonel. Uh, Jim, in uh, speaking about the Skull and Bone Society, as, as, a, um, as a recruiting and grooming tool for the world government, you said that they find those with ability and quote, who are more compliant. 
What evidence do you have for that more compliant part? Well, simply for the mere fact that the ones who aren't compliant go on off and they, they don't get leadership positions, and the ones who are compliant get the leadership positions. When I say compliant, I mean maybe I could, could have used another word. Let's say they find people who are more in tune with their worldview. Thank you. <laughs> Impli imp compliant kind of implies that they order them around. It's probably not that direct. Good presentation, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to comment on your um, United States note that Kennedy was attempting to uh, put into existence. I did want to mention that that was going to be backed by silver, so there was some backing behind it. Yeah. And also, the um, executive order number that Kennedy wrote to establish that, if you want to write this down, was executive order 11110. And you can check that out where it established the U.S. note. And the thing that I wanted to make comment about is that LBJ did not choose to continue uh, uh, publishing and minting the coin that, that Kennedy had started because this, this would have killed the golden goose that the Federal Reserve had in position. Uh, it would have, and that was just too much of a status change for this country and for the p very people you've been talking about. Exactly, uh, that's one of the reasons they wanted him in. <laughs> exactly. But I, from another book uh, that you wrote, I would like for you to maybe just briefly go over uh, the coup of 1934 and how that affected our current status. Right. If you take just a synopsis, thank you. I'll try to make Feedback. Okay, I'll try to make this brief. He asked about the coup of 1934. This was well established, little publicized, and you never heard about it in your history classes. In 1934, one year after Hitler had taken over total control as dictator of America, some of the wealthy families in this country, okay, the Rockefellers, the DuPonts, the Carnegies, they decided we needed to have something like that here. And they approached a former general with the Marine Corps, General Smedley Butler, and they proposed to him that they would put up the money to uh, fund a whole, uh, uh, several hundred thousand revolutionaries, and that we would have a coup in the United States of America, and they wanted Smedley Butler to be the new dictator, military dictator of the United States. Smedley Butler, to his everlasting credit, said to himself, uh, this is treason. And he didn't really say anything to them, but he went along with it for a little while until he could figure out who was behind it, what all they were doing. Then he went to Franklin Roosevelt and told him what was going on. And of course, Roosevelt had a real bad problem. If he got up publicly and said this is what was going on, it could shake all the financial institutions of this country to the bone. The Federal Reserve System would be in a shambles. They could even possibly lead to some sort of civil war. So what they did was leak this story to the papers. Most of the papers around the country never even bothered to report on it. New York Times did report on it. Congress held some hearings for about two years until everything died down. They basically confirmed everything that Smedley Butler told them, but then that's where it was left. It was like, huh. A lot of these people who were involved in this fled the country at the time and only later came back. So don't believe that there can't be an attempt at a coup in this country because there was in 1934. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for this presentation today, and thank you for being, having the courage to bring this information forward to us. And I'd like to know if you've ever heard of a document called the Protocols of the... I wonder if you've heard of a document called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion? Yes. Let me, let me address this real quick. I address this in Rule by Secrecy. He's asking about the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. First and foremost, yes, it is a hoax that was perpetrated by the Tsarist police uh, during World War I in an effort to try to uh, stigmatize the Jews in Russia at that time and uh, gather support for the Tsar. However, the tenets of this thing are too serious, too detailed, too thoughtful. If you'll go back, you'll find that the, some of the alteration they did was change Sion, S-C-I-O-N, to Zion, Z-I-O-N, in an effort to try to lay it off onto the Jews. Sion, of course, brings us into the Priory of Sion, and uh, several scholars have decided that the protocols are legitimate, but they are a document of the Illuminati. 
not the Jews, okay? So what you have to do, my advice to you is to try to find a copy of the protocols and read them. It is really chilling because it's just like the report from Iron Mountain. They can claim it's a hoax, but when you read it, you know this is not a hoax. It's a game plan for taking over the world. But again, let me emphasize, this was not done by the Jews, okay? The Jews have been as victimized by these people as everybody else. Yeah, I have one correction on your timeline. You said Eisenhower and Dulles got us into the Vietnam War. Eisenhower kept us out of Dien Bien Phu when the French were trying to get us in, get, it into, get us into the war. He stated that it's the wrong war, the wrong place, at the wrong time. The guy who got us into the war was JFK. Well, I would disagree with you on that, although what you said essentially is correct. The reason that they didn't want to go in with the French is because they didn't want the French in there. They wanted to wait and let the French get run out so that we wouldn't have any competition when we moved in. And all I can tell you is, is that uh, uh, C.L. Salzberg of the New York Times said that John Foster Dulles personally told him that he created CETO to give the power of the president the power to intervene in Southeast Asia. I do agree with you. I think Eisenhower being a general and having come through a world war was hesitant to get us involved in a war over there. That's why all he did was start to send military advisors. And that's all JFK did. He increased them. When he took office, they were like, five or six thousand military advisors in Southeast Asia and by the time he was assassinated in fall of 63 that had been increased to like 12,000 so there were but they were military advisors okay and yes they went out on patrols and yes if they got in a firefight they would shoot back to defend themselves but it was only Lyndon Johnson that put ground combat troops in Vietnam and ordered up rolling thunder and that's when the war really got underway yeah Ed, Jim, I was wondering if you could offer any comments on FEMA, um, also its authority and possible uh, place well, and role in, in, in this game. I got a question for you all. Since when is it the job of FEMA to investigate the tragedy of the space shuttle? And since when is it the job of FEMA? Who, who investigated the World Trade Center bombing? Was it the New York Fire Department? No. Was it the New York Police Department? No. Was it the FBI? No. It was FEMA. And what did FEMA do? They hired 26 structural engineers, rushed them through there, let them go there for a day and a half, wouldn't let them look at most of the stuff, already were shipping the metal out of there, would not allow them to do tests on it. The head of the panel even complained, but then based on what little they got to see and what they were told, they finally issued a report and said, well, airplanes hit the building, I guess the temperatures got high and they all collapsed. There was no investigation and it was all covered up by FEMA. What about constitutional power or a possible place in this whole power game? Constitutional power? Well, you know, we have a constitution, and, and let me, don't, don't anybody get me wrong, you know, the uh, form of government that we pay lip service to in this country, I will be the first to agree, is the finest that has ever been put together in the history of this world. Our problem is not the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence. Our problem is that we're not adhering to it. We're not following the Constitution of this country. When the President of the United States gets up and says, my lawyers have informed me that I don't even have to consult with Congress to go fight a war over in the Middle East, he obviously has not read the Constitution of the United States because it plainly states that only Congress shall have the power to declare war. And, and let's think about that for just a half second because on, on first blush, that's like, well, boy, those clowns can't even agree on when to adjourn, you know? And <laughs> we want them to have power to declare war. But hey, the guys that framed the Constitution, they were pretty smart. Because yeah, there's a bunch of grafters and grifters and malcontents and bozos up in Washington. But if three quarters of them all agree that we need to go to war, then maybe we need to go to war. And if they can't agree, if they can't get three quarters of a vote of Congress, then we probably don't need to be going to war. So it's a pretty smart system. And our problem is we're not following it. Thank you. Hi, Jim. Hi. Um, David Icke had um, a big uh, sold out conference in uh, London uh, recently um, talking about exactly the same subjects. Um, and uh, he also spent a bit of time on um, the evidence for um, you know, reptilian 
um, oriented c c control of um, you know the top of this negative pyramid, if you like. You know, um, what sort of input are you getting on the same subject? Um, it's interesting because when you follow the evidence, you just kind of get there. But let me tell you something. I met David Ike, and I really I kind of like David. And uh, he it's interesting because I wasn't even aware of him. Uh, until at the last moment writing Rule by Secrecy. And, uh, and yet we were both following the evidence and we were both running pretty parallel. The big difference is this. Along with my newspaper background, I also augmented my low reporter's pay by working and dabbling in public relations and advertising. And I know enough about public relations that I don't believe I'm going to really win friends and influence a lot of people by publicly calling the Queen Mother of England a 200-year-old reptilian cannibal. <laughs> it's not to be saying it's not true, it's just I'm saying, <laughs> I'm just saying I'm not saying that. <laughs> Thanks. Have I got just one very quick one, if that's okay? Um, you were talking about uh, intervention in um, evolution. Um, what inf what's information have you got on this um, thing about rhesus negative blood and uh, um, possible link with alien abductees as well? The possible link with what? The, the idea that there shouldn't be people with rhesus negative blood in theory. Oh, well, there's all kinds of strange things. I'm not, uh, uh, you got to understand, folks, I, I, I don't claim to be a huge expert in particularly anything. I, I'm, I'm the last of a dying breed. I'm a generalist, okay? I know a little bit about a lot of things. And I want to tell you something, I think that's sorely missing in this country today. The problem we have in this country, thank you. As I know doctors and lawyers and, and, you know, professional people, computer experts, and they're brilliant, they're well educated, and they're very thoughtful, but they got tunnel vision. All they know is what they know. In fact, some of the most closed-minded people I've ever run into are medical doctors. <laughs> and, and the thing is, so where is there a place in our society for a philosopher? Or, for, or a generalist, somebody knows a little bit. Somebody's got to step back and look at the forest instead of inspecting the trees all day. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not going to tell you I got it 100% right, but this is what I see. Thanks, thank Jim. You. Hi, I was just going to thank you, Jim, for being a generalist and doing our homework for us. <laughs> um, what I think is really frightening is that most Americans aren't aware of what is in the Homeland Security Act, including yeah. myself. Including and Congress. They don't know what's in there. <laughs> and I was going to ask you, I had heard something that they were going to be keeping track or making a list of what library books we check out. And I was wondering if that was part of the Homeland Security Act. Yes, it is. And they can go into your library and question your librarian to get, turn over your records and under the law she cannot even tell, she's subject to prosecution if she informs you that they're investigating you. Thank you. I'm telling you, what you don't know can hurt you. That's scary. We got time, we, we got two more, one more. We got time for one more, sorry. Yeah, hi. <laughs> Uh, have you ever considered this uh, war against Iraq is not over oil? Uh, that because Colin Powell is going to is to show proof of uh, Iraq uh, tie-in with Al Qaeda. So maybe if we get to Iraq, we will get to Osama bin Laden. No, if we want to get Saddam and Sa mm -hmm. bin Laden, we need to go to Saudi Arabia. There's where the problem is. They are the ones who have financed militant Muslims all around the world. They are the ones who have financed Salim bin Laden. And by the way, I got I got to say quickly three things that you have to understand. I've mentioned these to understand what's going on right now. Who put George W. Bush in the oil business? Who put up the money? Salim bin Laden, Osama bin Laden's older brother, put George W. Bush in the oil business. Had extensive holdings down in South Texas. It's all been written about in Texas, but you haven't heard about it. The Bushes and the Bin Ladens are like that, not only in business-wise, but socially. In 2000, George Herbert Walker Bush and the family went to Saudi Arabia and visited with their good buddies, the Bin Ladens. What do you think the odds are of that? 
Number two thing you have to understand is that I've already mentioned is that Prescott Bush was an unrepentant supporter of Hitler at a time of war. Not just a Nazi sympathizer, he was working to provide money and materials to our enemy in a time of war. The, the acorn never falls too far from the tree. And three, you have to understand that the Bushes and the Windsors are the same bloodline. And once you understand this, everything starts taking on a little bit different view. And I thank you all for your time and patience. Thank you. Mike, please. Thank you, Jim. Just bloody awesome, guys. Um,